everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Data Standard Audio Experience. Uh, today on our show, we have Ryan Barton, the Chief Analytics Officer at Barnes Crossing Auto Group. And today we're speaking about data in the automotive industry. So welcome to the show, Ryan. It's so great to have you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, could you just introduce yourself to the audience and tell us more about your work? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, like like uh, Catherine was saying, my name is Ryan Barton. Um, I uh, have a degree in applied mathematics from UC Berkeley and had a few um, different jobs out of school, one in, in finance, another in sales. And uh, about a year ago, I got hired by Barnes Crossing Auto Group as the chief analytics officer. Um, we are a mid-sized conglomerate in the automotive industry in the, in the southeastern United States. We're based in Tupelo, Mississippi. We have uh, 13 uh, car dealerships in four states, uh, six Hertz rental car franchises. Um, and we have two other um, subsidiaries. We have um, an internal auto finance company called Barnhall Financial Services. Um, and at the beginning of this year, we launched, um, it's, it's, the, it's a consumer to dealer vehicle online auction site um, called Carmigo. So we have a lot of different businesses going on and, and um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, it sounds like super interesting stuff you're working on today. And um, a lot of different in organizations are trying to be more data driven and data science is a very newer field that a lot more companies are trying to bring into their technology and just into their company overall to solve these complex problems. And so how is your company and the work that you're doing um, being more data driven in general? Sure. So uh, as far as, you know, being more data driven, probably the main focus has been with our auto finance company um, that, that's Barnhall. And, uh, you know, really the idea for, for Barnhall was conceived about seven years ago by the owner of our group. And, and the reason was, um, well, there are a lot of people um, in, in, the, in the southeast where we were having trouble selling cars to for various reasons, whether that be a poor credit history or low income or, you know, various reasons. And uh, we're all about helping people and, and we want to sell more cars. So we basically started our own finance company. We wanted to be the bank to ensure that we never had trouble finding a bank to finance a loan. Um, and now we can control it and we can, you know, play different, you know, games with that. Um, and as far as Barnhall goes, you know, I, I came on to help automate the underwriting process to to ensure that um, we're making um, better underwriting decisions, you know, whether we which loans we approve and if we um, distorted a client or do a counter offer, what the conditions were, you know, what what the counter offer is. Um, also deciding which vehicles to trade in, uh, when, when to offer offer our customers um, trade ins as well. Um, and um, as far as the auction site Carmigo goes, um, the goal is it's a consumer to dealer auction um, site. So, so what that means is if someone were to go online, so if someone goes online, posts uh, their car, an inspector comes out within 24 hours, inspects the vehicle, makes sure it, you know, basically get, gives it a a, a, ra a condition rating, whether that be good, you know, very good, you know, rough, you know, etc. And uh, every weekday at 2 p.m., we have auctions where dealers bid on your vehicle and we use the power of leverage in the customer's favor as opposed to against them. Traditionally, if you were to trade in your vehicle, you go to the dealer and there'd be multiple cars, you know, that are trying to, you know, they're trying to trade into the same de dealer. So the dealer has the leverage, right? So, so you can imagine you're not gonna get a great trade in price for your vehicle. Well, now we have multiple dealers bidding on the same vehicle. So we're trying to, to really create our own market, so to speak, um, that, that gives um, our customers uh, better value for their car. So there's going to be a lot of um, data analytics to play and we'll, we'll, or to, to, to understand and, 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 and for me to, to play around with. And um, that will help us, um, you know, understand, you know, where used, used and new vehicle um, prices are at, you know, in, in, in the market. Um, you know, we're also doing some other things with uh, the, the owner of our group um, had also, you know, brought me on to help him it goes. So we're investing in different tools, um, different resources, different data for me to, um, or for us to analyze and, and improve, improve our returns, you know, improve our alpha as well as, you know, de you know as well as to, um, you know, mitigate our risk um, as far as investments, whether that be in the equity markets, um, as far as investing in new businesses, investing in real estate. Um, and uh, the great thing with going back to the data we have um, with Carmigo and with with uh, mostly with Carmigo, 
um, you know, we can sort of predict, you know, where car prices are, you know, in relation to um, other assets um, due to different economic factors and due to inflation. And we, we, we can also analyze car sales uh, within the group as well as across the Southeast region and the entire United States um, and see, you know, compare that to how um, used and new car prices are and find new markets to invest in to define where do, where do we want to buy a new, new, new car dealership or a new, um, you know, different, um, basically new places to, to, to transact and to, to buy and sell um, cars based on demographic data and existing car sales data. Yeah, and so that sounds like there's a lot of different complex problems that your organization is trying to solve. And so I wanted to just jump into the the idea of just building these process um, analytical models. So can you just talk through um, what is the process like when you and your team are thinking about building these predictive analytics models? And um, just what are some things that you think about? What are some things that you map out? Um, tell us the process. Yeah, great question. Um, so I, I guess when we're when I'm given a problem, you know, to, to solve, I guess the, the first, you know, thing, we're, first step is to really, you know, dissect the nature of the problem. What What is the problem we're trying to solve? Are we trying to increase the net profit? Are we trying to reduce the probability of some negative event from occurring? Are we um, trying to sort um, different um, categories of data, you know, by some factor um, there's tons of different things that that we we when we're sort of you know working through what kind of problem this is and, and once we understand the nature of the problem then we you know ask ourselves you know okay so what kind of data would, do we need that that would would help us solve this problem um, maybe it's data we're already tracking and storing maybe it's data that um, we need to to find online or maybe it's data that we need to um, we need to figure out how to negotiate for or buy from somebody else. Um, so, but once we figure out, you know, what the problem is and, and what data can help us solve it, I guess the, the third step would be to uh, figure out what tools um, would help us solve that problem. And for me, my go-to tools would be my, the IDE I use is Visual Studio Code because it's, it's, it's simple. Um, it's easy to use, the user interface is great. Um, and my language of, course, of choice is Python because it's general enough to solve just about any problem that, that I've come across. Um, there's tons of libraries out there, you know, internet resources to help me solve, you know, different types of problems. Um, there are tons of data scientists out, very skilled data scientists who um, know all these different languages, but um, I feel like they're in the, in the market of data, sci the, the, the market of data scientists, you know, in the United States, there um, are probably too many um, data scientists who know tons of languages, but maybe not enough uh, statistics or, or have enough domain knowledge or communication skills. Um, may, may, maybe maybe that's, that's something I've noticed. Um, and my philosophy is if you can, um, you know, keep it simple, you know, um, you know, if you can solve a problem with Python, um, why would you you know, go, why would you spend time to you learn a new language and, um, and and make it more complicated than it needs to be? And 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 if for whatever reason, you know, the, the you know, obviously Python can be slow. Um, so if you need to speed up your code somehow and you, you need to learn a new, that new language at that point, you know, maybe that, that at that time it would be worth it. But um, that's sort of, you know, my philosophy there. And um, I guess the, the, the fourth step would be to clean the data. Once you have the tools in place and the data in place, um, you want to make sure that it's, uh, it's in a, a, you know, a position where you can, you can analyze it. And, and the fifth step would be to, to, um, to map out a model, to fit the data. Maybe you, you need to train some kind of machine learning model um, to understand uh, and, and to predict um, you know, what, what, you know, and, and solve the problem that you need to. Um, and, and another thing I've noticed in, in industry is, is most problems, you know, most business problems, not, not all, certainly not all, but most can be solved with some kind of regression, whether that be single, one, one variable, multivariate, um, not all can be used with linear, you know, maybe there's, um, you need to transform data, you know, via some kind of exponential logarithmic or polynomial function. Um, but you know, maybe you can use some kind of um, regression function to to solve your problem, and and um, and maybe after that you would you would fit your data, you, you would you'd funnel your data through um, some other uh, tool to display it, um, or, or 
or maybe you have to uh, some other um, um, some other function, so to speak. Um, but the last step would be to communicate results. Um, you know, the, if you can't, um, you can have the most sophisticated uh, neural network model out there, but if you don't know how to monetize it, let alone communicate it, um, it's meaningless. So uh, at the end of the day, I think I think communication skills is is something that's really important. Um, at the end of the data science really is a sales position. At the end of the day, you got to be able to sell not only yourself, but the value that you're providing. Um, I think that's um, that's of the utmost importance. Yeah, and I think that's such an interesting way to think about it from um, a data science kind of perspective. Um, and just being able to really sell yourself and selling the value of what you can extract with all of the technical work that you do and being able to explain it in business terms and seeing how it can help the business overall. Um, and I think it's also a great point that you brought up the importance of almost being a generalist and knowing a little bit of math, of math and programming and the communication side and just knowing a little bit of everything to be able to put everything together to help the business. I think that's a great insight that you have brought to the podcast. And um, I wanted to also talk about some projects that you worked on. Is there any particular project you've been able to work on that was your favorite for any reason? Yeah, I, I, probably my favorite one was is the, the automated underwriting model, um, which is it's somewhat integrated, somewhat connected with the trade in model um, as far as, you know, which which customer to trade in at which, you know, offer offer to, to trade in a new vehicle, you know, at which point in time. But but as far as, you know, underwriting goes, we're um, you know, you were, we're looking at all the past data we have for the history of our company, you know, all these different characteristics on our customers, their credit score, um, income, you know, payment to income ratio, loan to value ratio, all, all sorts of sorts of things to help us um, improve our underwriting as well as looking at um, their past payment patterns, their transaction history, seeing um, how consistent that they pay and um, really understanding how the amor looking at the amortization schedules and how they work, how they work. There are thousands of different amortization schedules out there people don't don't realize because, um, you know, interest compounds in different periods, whether that be monthly, daily, yearly, quarterly, etc. Um, or it could be simple interest. Um, each state has their own um, usury law codes, um, and um, we have to factor all that in. Um, and and amortizations, you know, it's the, the schedules are, are credited in different. There's there's normal schedules, Canadian, um, you know, uh, rule of seventy eight. There's all sorts of um, different amortization schedules out there. Every every fixed income type of product has um, an amortization schedule. And uh, these these amortization schedules get really muddy once you start factoring in late fees and miscellaneous fees. It's not just about you know how principal and interest gets credited. And when we want to trade in someone, um, we want to make sure that that they're in a, a good enough you know they're in a, a significant enough positive equity position, meaning that they own they have enough they own enough of the car in terms of their principal, um, the percent principal, the loan to value ratio is, is low enough. Um, so there's there's tons of different things to, to play and around with that, and, and that's that's an ongoing project. It's been fun, but it's it's also probably gonna keep me busy and and employed for a good while longer. So that that's good news. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And in terms of um, the work that you do, I'm sure you you've had a lot of great experience. What advice do you have for those who might want to go into a role that's similar to yours, or just into predictive analytics in general? Yeah, um, I guess going back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, data science, at the end of the day, I mean, it's a sales position, you know, I've met a lot of data scientists who are great with people and some some who aren't. Um, and people want to hire and work with people that they, they get along with. And if someone's gonna, especially if they're gonna, you know, create a position for you and invest in you, um, how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie is a great book. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess as far as my career goes, like I wasn't um, the guy, you know, with a 4.0 .0 GPA from UC Berkeley, you know, and got a job at Google right out of college making 120K. That, that, that wasn't, you know, me. I've had, you know, somewhat of a circuitous career path uh, for someone that, that, that has ended up in, in, you know, a job similar to mine. Um, and I guess I'd say as far as um, the, the current business environment that, that we have, um, there's new companies coming out all the time, you know, that are looking for, um, you know, experience um, and, and intelligent data scientists to help them um, improve their, their bottom line. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll say that the, a lot of the easiest, you know, ideas have already been, been done. You know, the, the best job, the best idea 
as far as data science goes that I can think of was was Google, you know, basically take all the information on the internet and and try to make money with it. Like that's literally the 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 the, the lowest hanging fruit I can think of. So um, now it's like that all these the, the fruit is hangs even higher and and um, the data scientists of tomorrow are going to need to to think um, more creatively. They're going to need to it's going to take some some hard work and some taking, you know, the, the road less uh, traveled by in order to um, you know, have a great career and, 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 and whether that be, you know, start a business for yourself or, um, to, uh, you know, find, find a job. And I guess the first thing I think of is, you know, what industries, uh, are, um, are the most right to be transformed by data science and, and a couple, you know, industries I can think of just like off the top of my head would, uh, maybe be, um, you know, agribusness, you know, you know, agriculture, farming, um, you know, there's, with population, you know, growth, you know, and, and you know, trends are, are, are there are different trends in different parts of the world, of course, but you know, land is scarce, and uh, we're going to need to figure out how to uh, make better use of uh, our our existing resources. And there are different companies that are um, coming up trying to solve this, and they're they're going to have they're going to need you know data scientists to help them um, help them solve those problems. Um, and 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 with land being scarce, you know, real estate, real estate analytics. We're, we're probably already in the second inning with that, but um, there's going to need to be more um, uh, the, the more work to be done in that that space. Um, trucking and shipping as well, lots of logistics problems, um, so small business lending. Um, not all not all business loans are, are venture capital. You know, there, there's um, different you know small businesses out there that that you know or you know investment companies that that are going to need um you know data scientists to, to figure out you know where to allocate capital you know whether that in in you know in a wealth management you know uh context as well uh you know you know quantitative finance is, is not going anywhere there's um you know there's there's always going to be you know people are going to need to there's going to be data and, and they're going to need smart people to figure out how to how to allocate um capital more efficiently and um you know, as far as, you know, how to how to find a job for yourself, I'd say the first thing is to maybe, um, maybe think about trying to figure out how to create a position for yourself. I, I, I heard once that for every job posting, there are four that that aren't posted, uh, jobs that are out there that that could be created, whether whether they're already, um, they, they, they're they aware that they, they need this position to be created or willing to create it um, with maybe a little nudging. Um, but there's there's four four job postings or four four available jobs for every job posting. So maybe you know once you find a, an industry, think of a, a find a, a, a whether that be a family business or a company, um, and you know reach out to uh, reach out to them, reach out to the owner, um, the CEO, and see if they'd be you know pitch them on projects you've worked on, ideas you have that that they can um, use to um, improve their bottom line and, and be willing and sell yourself to. Uh, figure out how to invest in you um, and create a position for you. You know, you might need to to wear a lot of hats. Maybe uh, you have, um, you, you have, hopefully you have other skills. Maybe you could be the uh, digital marketing person in addition to analyzing data. Maybe you could um, be the IT person, you know, and in addition to analyzing, you know, running the analytics, uh, you could be a salesperson, you know, the, there's all sorts of things. If you have any investing prowess, you can, um, you know, pitch the, the business owner on on how to uh, better manage their money. You know, if you think about it, if, if, a, if a business owner had a net worth of say $10 million, it would behoove them to be willing to invest $100,000 in you to, uh, if you're able to improve their returns, um, you know, if, if $100,000 with write-offs, it maybe only cost them $60,000. So um, if you're able to provide an alpha, say a 0.6, you're able to improve their, their returns by 0.6% than they otherwise would have been, you know, whether that be investing in, in the, the equity or, or fixed income markets, uh, finding new businesses, investing in real estate, whatever it is. Um, you know that they'll they'll break even on your your on the, their investment in you, so to speak. So um, there's all sorts of things you can do to sort of pitch yourself to um, you know for to to to, to find a job to create and, and start off at maybe a higher position at a maybe a smaller company, maybe a large company. Yeah, great advice, definitely. And uh, where can everyone find you online to connect with you? 
<laughs> yeah, great question. I'm, I'm kind of a hermit. Uh, I don't have a YouTube channel or blogger or Twitter or anything like that, but uh, I have a LinkedIn. So feel free to look me up, uh, Ryan Barton um, and Barnes Crossing Auto Group, B-A-R-N-E-S, uh, everything else uh, spelled like it sounds. But um, yeah, it was, uh, I had a blast being on here. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, to our audience, for more information on the Data Standard, you can find us at www.datastandard.io, as well as on our LinkedIn and YouTube channel. And thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us. So great to have you on the show. And we hope to talk to you again soon. Sounds good. You as well.